When did you first grow curious about the paranormal? Dare you dig deeper? You are listening to Howl's Nasher. Welcome, everybody, back to House of Asher. This is Steve Asher, and this is episode 57. And what we're going to touch on today is um, growing up as a, as a small kid, um, there's a couple things that scared me. And one of the things that that scared me and fascinated me was the, the, the possession phenomenon. And something that conversely also drew me and made me extremely interested was the whole rites of exorcism and how that ties in. And along the way, I'd actually had met with a, a few people online, which, you know, it's it's a miracle, you know, that you can meet people, you know, across the country and across the world. Anyway, and um, the next gentleman who I have on is ties, is has ties with that sort of experience and is a psychic medium. And I would like to introduce everybody to Robert, and make sure, tell me if I'm doing this wrong, Riggy? That is correct, Riggy. That is correct, Steve. I'm, I'm amazed, because I butcher I butcher names. I'm good with faces, but I butcher names all day long. So. Well, you did a fantastic job, so thank you. My, my last name is an Italian last name, and a lot of people mispronounce it all the time, so I'm used to it. So thank you for pronouncing it correctly. Well, you know, the thing is, even if I get it right, I have such a strong southern accent. It's, you know, mm-hmm. most people go, eh, that's close enough for state work. Got to pass. <laughs> I understand that fully. I understand. Man, so anyway, again, thank you for being on. Um, you know, it's so, it's it's interesting because, um, obviously, it's a, it's a thing where you come at it in the whole possession phenomenon, in kind of a different way because most people see it like in the old, um, mo- you know, monster movies and Hammer films and, and Universal stuff, which I'm a huge fan of, and I, and I know you are as well. Um, to where it was very a very strict, you know, Catholic thing, and that definitely ties into it. But you ha- bring something different to it because with with you being a psychic medium, let's talk a little bit about that. And could you maybe explain to the folks a little bit more about you know who you are and what you do? Yes, thank you, Steve. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Rickey. I am 64 years old. I live in Peoria, Illinois. Um, I am a psychic medium. My first experience is when I was four years old, and it's just gotten stronger and stronger over these many, many years. Um, I must also tell you that I am Roman Catholic, so my spirituality is based on my Roman Catholicism. I do not attempt to convert anyone. To Christianity or to Islam or to uh, Judaism. That is not my point. My point being is that my own spirituality is based on my Roman Catholicism. I also have a master's degree in forensic psychology and also in psychiatric social work. Um, And for many, many years, I was a criminal profiler for the state of Florida, as well as having my private practice. And working in the paranormal field and having the, the education and the experience within psychology, they both well, they both work well together, very, very well together. Um, I do a lot of radio programs. I do a lot of public and private events. I do many, many readings. Um, I must also tell everyone that I do not charge for my services. Not at all. My gifts and talents come from God, and I do not abuse them. I do not um, charge anyone. If someone wants to give me a donation, that is fine, but I do not ask. And usually that's the first thing they ask. How much do you charge? And I leave it up to them. And if they can't give me anything, that is fine. I am here to help. Um, I must also tell you that at this very moment that I am mentoring children who I will call children of the paranormal. And I meet with them. I mentor them. Um, A lot of their parents have just heard me on the radio. And um, they're having having, um, conflicts in whether or not they should send their children to a psychiatrist. 
psychiatrist or to a psychologist because of what the children are experiencing and talking about. Because of my degree and my experience in psychology, I speak to the child individually. The parents are always within eye and ear um, shout, um, shot, excuse me. Um, and I determine from then um, if a person needs to be seen uh, by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, okay? Um, after I speak to the child and do some, especially if the child is very young, I do a lot of uh, play therapy as well as art therapy with them. After speaking with them, speak to their parents, um, and I reassure them that their, parents, that their children are not in need of any psychiatric medication, uh, that they truly have gifts and talents from God. And so the youngest one that I'm working with just turned nine, and the oldest one is 15. And the older children are very protective of the young children. Um, Steve, I must also tell you that a lot of these children uh, feel um, isolated. They are afraid to talk to their friends at school, their buddies at school, because they do not know how, how the other children or their friends are going to react. A lot of times this is a family secret. And, um, and so, so what I also do is that I reassure the children that what they are experiencing, I validate what they're experiencing is true. And so in meeting with them, taking them to different places um, that, uh, that have spirits in them, and their spirits are around us 24-7. They're around us all the time. Um, and there's different degrees of the gifts and talents that these children have. Some are psychic, some are mediums, some are both. Okay. Um, and so I am there to instruct them also um, to how to turn it on and off. And uh, so they're not going to be bombarded every time they walk by a cemetery or go to the store or see spirits looking out the window and such like that. Uh, these children have, a lot of them had very poor grades in school, but now mentoring these children, giving them the self-confidence that they are normal, um, all of them, all of them are A and B and C students. I know children will be children and that is fantastic, okay? Um, I allow them to be children and I, and, and I reassure their parents that they also need to allow them to be children, but they do have gifts and talents. Um, and so, like I said, that a lot of these children did feel isolated. They felt alone. Um, and now they have changed. They have, they have changed so much. They've changed so much within the last year. Um, I also volunteer at a hospice for children who are dying in their homes. And I'm usually called in between 12 and 24 hours before God calls them home. Um, and that is a wonderful, wonderful experience. I am there for the child as well as for the parents and whatever they need. And we talk about angels and I sing to them and I talk to them and I hold them um, and what if the parents need also. And we can go into that a little later, okay? Um, when it comes to the right of exorcism, I'm going to be telling tonight of my experience um, in two exorcisms, especially one with a young man and I can, I can say his first name. His name is Kevin. Um, and um, I'm not able, because of confidentiality, um, I will not say his last name. I will say, I will tell you that he lives in West Central Illinois. And that's where I live. I live in Peoria, Illinois. And Kevin lives in West Central Illinois, about an hour west of where Peoria is. But, See, before we get started, I'm going to say the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, because again, what we're going to be talking about tonight is very dangerous. Um, also, it's going to be very informative and enlightening, um, and so I need to say the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel to protect all of us, okay? Sure. So if I may do so, Steve? Absolutely, go ahead. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in this day and night of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness.
this and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl through the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Every time, every time I go to any home and um, talk with people to assist them, um, every time I talk to folks on the telephone, I always say the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel to help us. In fact, that the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel is used in the Roman rite of exorcism. It's one of the oldest prayers in the rite, in the Roman rite of exorcism. Um, about a year and a half ago or so, I received a call from this young man, his name is Kevin, and I had I'm, and I had no idea who he was. And I asked him how he got my telephone number because I give it freely um, on the air, and I will give my telephone number um, to anyone who wants it. If they need assistance, have any questions, I am here for them. And Kevin said that he heard from a friend who heard me on one of the uh, radio programs that I did. It was Paranormal Soup with Jason Plant. Mm -hmm. And Kevin called me because he needed help. And this was about midnight, 1230 or so. And my phone is on 24-7. Whoever needs assistance, I am here for them day and night. And Kevin was telling me that he was going through some strange things and didn't know how to deal with them. Um, and again, I did not know Kevin at all. Um, Kevin was very curious in what I do and who I am. And um, what made this so so interesting and also um, frightening to a point is that all at once Kevin began to talk in a most guttural voice and he began to cackle. And so in my mind, I was thinking, well, he could be schizophrenic, he could be delusional, he could be drunk, he could be high. So I took all those things into consideration. I told Kevin that I was here, here for him and anything that he needed. And I asked him to take some deep breaths and to relax. And he tried to. All at once, he started to speak in this guttural voice again, he started to laugh. And all at once, Steve, I will never forget this, that all at once what came out of Kevin's mouth was, you cannot do anything to help him. Nothing. He is mine. You have no power. Your God cannot do anything to help him. And then Kevin began to cry. And again, I said the prayer, I said the prayer to say, Michael, the archangel, and the laugh that came from Kevin was unbelievable. Um, and again, I told Kevin to relax and that I would cheer for him. Um, many times, Steve, I would have to say Kevin's name um, to reassure him and who I am and what was going on. Because there would be times that he had no idea of what he was saying um, and what he was doing. So again, to bring him back to the surface and to fight the demon that was inside of him. And truly there was a demon inside of him. Truly there was. I felt it. I have two angels that assist me, who protect me, and they, and they were assisting me. Being a psychic medium, I felt, I felt and I heard what was going on with inside of him. And again, the demon came out and said, you do not, you do not have the power. You do not have the God to help you. And again, I prayed the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. And every time that I did that, the capital, the laughter got worse. It was very diabolical laughter. 
And again, he says, the demon says to me, I know who you are, and I know what you've done in your past. I know everything about you. I did not want to get in conflict with the demon at all, and of course, one should never do that. Okay, there's a time and place for that. Okay? Um, And again, um, and, and again, I said, Kevin, Kevin, and then Kevin said, yes, I am here, Robert. Um, but then Kevin was telling me what he was experiencing, that he was seeing blood all over the place. He saw blood on him, um, and there were no cuts. He was telling me there were no cuts on him at all, and he was just very sick to his stomach. He was smelling the most horrible, horrible stench. And again, that is the sign of a demon also, okay? Um, and again, the demon came through, and, you know, again, I said, you know, I said a prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, um, and again, he screamed, this horrible, horrible scream, a scream that I've never heard before in my life. Um, and then I told the demon, I said, you have no power over me? Not at all, none whatsoever, that I am protected by the love of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, and I am protected by Jesus. And Kevin is protected by Jesus. And then it even, and then he became very, very belligerent. Uh, the demon started to cuss and swear at me, telling me that my, and I can't use the words um, of what the demon said on air, um, but they were very, very foul, very, very nasty. And the demon then said, Robert, I'm going to tell you something about yourself because I want you to effing know that I am who I am and that's what he was saying to me and he said Robert you are adopted and that is correct Steve I am adopted I am and again Kevin did not know me from Adam or Eve Kevin didn't even know my last name okay so the demon was telling me some things about me that were correct very correct he was even, the demon was even telling me of where I lived. And he also said that I don't, if I don't leave Kevin alone, um, that he is going to come and destroy me. And again, I said the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. The phone went dead completely. I tried to contact Kevin again, and it must have been maybe five, ten minutes. Finally, I reconnected with Kevin. Um, a lot of times when the evil one um, is involved, that the phones will go dead, the phones will be drained, um, and so that is a sign right there that something, you know, that something is not of this world, okay? I told Kevin that he was going to be okay, and that I was here to help him. He wanted me to come, now this is now one o'clock in the morning, okay? Um, he wanted me to come and see him immediately. And I was, like I said, he lives like an hour, an hour and a half away from me. Okay. I said I could not come to him immediately. Also, when I go on these cases, Steve, that I never go by myself because you never know what you're going to run into. Right. You know, um, so I need to protect myself also. Okay. Am I scared to a point, but it's a, but it's a very healthy being scared, okay? Um, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want anyone to be hurt, okay? I told Kevin that I could be there in the morning, and at 10 o'clock in the morning the next day, um, I left with a friend of mine um, to see Kevin. And uh, Kevin and I spoke on and off during the night, he was vomiting. He he was telling me um, of how his body was retching and such like that. And being a psychic medium, that I picked up on all of those things. It was like, and then I asked my angels to assist me because I wanted to feel everything that he was feeling, everything. And it's just not with Kevin, but I want to experience what the person is going through, so I know, so I know how 
to work with that specific person and their specific need, okay? Um, so the next day, um, my friend and I left. I'm not able to tell you my friend's name uh, because of confidentiality, but I can tell you that this person knows exorcisms. He knows, he knows and has worked with individuals that have been possessed, okay? I can also, I can say that he is a clergy member of the Catholic Church. I can say that much, okay? Okay. So we drove to Kevin. Kevin lived way out in the woods and lived in a mobile home. I called Kevin prior to that and, tell him, and told him that we were on our way. He gave us direction. Um, and again, um, I come from a psychological um, arena as well as the paranormal, okay? But what I experienced the night before was Kevin with a demon telling me um, about who I was and about being adopted that, and again, Kevin had no idea who I was, not none whatsoever, nothing. It's not that I am embarrassed to talk about my adoption because I am not, okay? But it's just the fact it's something that I don't, I, I, you know, it just doesn't come up in conversation unless I talk about it. So again, Kevin had no idea, nothing. And also the demon was telling me other things, other things that have happened in my life. Um, I must go back for a moment and say that I kept asking what the demon's name was. And again, that is the first round of, of, of the situation um, that we must know what the demon's name is. And again, he was using uh, the F word and all sorts of things. Um, I know at one point he said, if you want to know my effing name, then you figure it, figure it out yourself. And again, I said, St. Michael the Archangel, protect Michael and protect me. Um, so, this, so this clergy member, I can say that he's a priest, because he is. Uh, so the priest and I went to Kevin um, home. Um, I remembered and I write down everything that happens when I get any telephone call from someone. Um, and that's just the psychologist and therapist in me uh, to, um, to take notes. And so I did. So I brought those notes with me. Uh, but when I went in, I observed that Kevin's home was very neat. I mean, it was, there, nothing was out of place. Um, Kevin was wearing a T-shirt. There were no scratches on his arms at all. Uh, because remember what I told you about that Kevin was saying that he was very bloody. Uh, there were no marks on him whatsoever. Um, there were no uh, scratches. Um, it wasn't like that he was self-mutilating himself because he wasn't. Um, I, um, he even took off his shirt and there were no marks on him that he made himself, okay? There were no marks at all, okay? Um, and so we sat down with Kevin and we talked and immediately, and I know that when the priest and I got closer to Kevin's home that that psychically I experienced what I was that what I'm going to be getting into that I that I knew it was going to be a struggle for Kevin's soul. Okay, um, but still I did not back down, and you don't back down, not at all. But if someone isn't first in doing exorcism. And if they try to do anything like that and don't know, don't have the experience or knowledge, it turns out horrible. And so, and um, so I, you know, so I know that from a long time ago. Um, and so I have the experience. I know what I'm doing. Um, my spirituality within my Roman Catholicism. I know that God is with me. I covered myself with God's might, light. Uh, both of us, uh, the priest and I, prayed on the way to see Kevin. Um, but again, when we walked in, it, the mood changed. <laughs> it changed. At first, when we first walked in, it was very, oh, um, the air was light and it was nice. You know what I mean? It was very comfortable. But after being there less than a minute, two minutes, it changed completely. 
even I began to smell the stench. So Kevin and I and the priests were talking. And again, I come from a psychological era, uh, arena, so I wanted to make sure that Kevin wasn't psychologically ill. I wanted to make sure that he was not hallucinating. I wanted to make sure that he wasn't self-mutilating himself. And so we went through this process and we just talked. And then all at once, his throat got very, very large. He began to shake. And the guttural sounds that came from him, not, it wasn't him, but it was the demon itself telling me that, that Kevin was his, and that if we and the effing priest didn't leave, that, uh, that, that he was going to destroy our lives also. Wow. And Robert? again, I took the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. Go ahead, Steve, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just gonna uh, say something real quick. I, I didn't wanna s stop the flow, but I had a, a few quick questions. Um, first of all, um, with your training, it's you know it's obviously that is a godsend, part you know no pun intended, due to the fact that like you said there are so many classical psychological ailments and like you said you know uh, you know self abuse and uh, delusional uh, situations and and that you know it can kind of cross the line and someone who is not versed in that and educated in that can get that turned around. Um, now like say I've, real quick question if someone was to say, come and, and feel that they, their cells were possessed, or they had a loved one that's possessed, what, what's like step one? Because, you know, you see, like, of course, in the movie, they go speak to their, their local parish priest or whatever, but is that something that they can kind of handle? Is it more of a thing like you really need to speak to, like, an archbishop or someone higher up? What I have suggested to folks that have called me, um, because they're stating that, you know, that things are not going right in their homes and such paranormally, you know, paranormal wise. I asked them if their house has ever been blessed and if it isn't to go, you know, to contact um, a minister, um, a Catholic priest, and a Catholic priest will go into a home, Protestant or otherwise, into a home and bless the home, okay? I also caution the people who are experiencing paranormal things inside their homes to be very, very careful in how they phrase why they want their home blessed, okay? There are a lot of, there are more Catholic priests now that know about the right of exorcism. They know because they're trained now uh, in more of, of demonic um, situations. Um, but, be, but I tell them to be very, very careful and just ask the priest or the minister to come over and bless the house, okay? Um, and again, um, the par paranormal have become almost mainstream in our culture now. Before it was taboo, I had to be very, very careful growing up talking about anything paranormal-wise when I was small. And then when I was in high school, I had to be very, very careful because at the time, uh, you could be sent to a state hospital. Um, you could be given psych psychotropic medications like Thorazine and Haldol um, because they deemed one would be crazy, okay? Um, so I had to be very, very careful. And so I began to stuff a lot of what I was experiencing. And... I taught myself how to turn it on and off, like I'm teaching these children how to turn on and off their talent. Uh, but again, if someone needs a house blessing, um, make sure that the Catholic priest or the Catholic priest and the, or the Protestant minister knows how to do it correctly or just ask them to bless the house. If they ask why you need a blessing, just, you know, I tell the folks that, well, I just like to have my house blessed. Because if they go into detail that, well, I'm seeing shadow people, I'm hearing voices, I'm hearing footsteps, um, the priest or the minister may think that they are just drunk or they're just high. Do you understand that? Right. Or seeking some sort of attention due to whatever, some sort of psychological issue or a personal issue. Right. Right. Um, and so I tell them to be very careful. 
people. Also, I also told them to be very, very careful when they call uh, spirit groups um, because if they don't know what they're doing, if they use sage uh, and those types of things, um, it can make things a lot worse. It does. So one has to be very, very, very careful. Um, the seminars that I've done, and I'll get back to Kevin's situation in a second, sure. but the, what I have told groups and the seminars that I've been involved in, that I tell them that we are there for the people who have called us. Okay, you leave one's ego at the door. Okay, if you're there just to get evidence, big deal. You are there to help the person understand what is going on. Do I have an EVP machine? No, I don't. I have nothing to do with those um, those machines. I know that a lot of groups use them, and that's fantastic. But for me personally, because being a psychic medium and having my angels assist me, I don't need those. Exactly. Okay? Also, what I do is that I validate I validate what the people are experiencing, even if I don't experience it, because that is their own experience. That is their own perception. So whatever they are experiencing, I validate it because because that's what they are experiencing. Okay? So one has to be very careful. I know that a lot of these groups go in, like I said, and they have their own agenda. Uh, they get very giddy at times of all oh, the evidence and they hear things, they see things. Um, and again, we must be very, very respectful of coming into one's home. Be very respectful. Um, a lot of groups don't go into the detail that I do, like social history, because Steve, what I have experienced and since I've since what for about 40 years now of my life, that there is also there is always a psychological aspect of any paranormal behavior, or excuse me, paranormal activity. Okay, I always ask certain questions, yes and no questions, and more times than not, see um, that there is usually frustration, chaos, a change of job, a suicide. Um, something is not right within the home. And that's what I focus on first, okay? Because as they say that when there's frustration, anger, there's a suicide, a divorce, a change in job, anything like that that is traumatic, um, that is a perfect storm for the evil one to start approaching someone. It's a perfect storm. So I always tell everyone that it is like an onion. And as we know, an onion has a lot of layers. So we have to peel the layers back to get to the core of the situation. And getting to the core of the situation, then we can move on. And when I meet with people come into their homes, I tell them that it is a process. It's a process and it's going to take time. And again, I don't charge for anything that I do, nothing. So if it takes me six months or if it takes me a year, I am with these people through thick and thin. I am there for them and whatever they need. So going back to Kevin, so the priest, so the priest and I start to experience um, the demon. And again, I ask the demon's name. And in fact, Steve, I know what the demon's name is because he did give it to us, but in saying it, it's like a calling card, if you can understand that. If I say the demon's name, that is a calling card, and I choose not to uh, say his name, if that, if that is okay with you or not. No, yeah, I prefer it. I mean, I, I was just going to say, doing doing so much in, in ghostly investigations and whatnot, um, there was sort of a, a bit of a trend where, you know, uh, there was some joke about um, if there was a light, you know, like if a light went off, and it's like, you know, 1% chance of electrical problems, 90% chance of demons, you know, and everyone jumped on this and that, and then they think, well, I'm just going to go in there and cast this demon out. I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, I've been in 
maybe three situations that were iffy in regards of something right. darker. Definitely not demonic. Um, I don't play with that. And, you know, I was raised Southern Baptist, and um, I know that um, anything that fits the fits the bill of that is way out of my pay grade and way out of my knowledge base. And I, I think people, again, like you said, get in kind of a tar baby situation that they really regret. And like you said, a lot of times can cause so much more grief, not to just the family, but the investigator themselves, because then they're going to have issues with obsession and, you know, like you said, shadows and things scratching, you know, the walls are scratching you in your sleep and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, I want no part of a demon, you know, and right. Right. And that, and you know, also, um, also in my private practice, and you can always tell a good therapist, if the therapist knows if he or she are over their head in any situation with, you know, with a, a person coming in for counseling, then the sign of a good therapist, like a sign of a good um, psychic medium, is that we will refer them to someone who has more of an expertise. But because of people's egos, that a lot of times the groups will say, well, we can help you and everything. But in fact, they're, they are putting themselves into danger as well as the uh, folks that they are helping. Um, I know a lot of times that people have called me and said, well, this group said they were going to come back, but they haven't, and now what do we do? And that bothers me greatly because because that is an indication to me that those specific groups, certain groups, are just going in there for their own agenda, and that's not right. We are there to help. We, we are there to help them. Um, and what um, and what they're experiencing, and again, when you watch those shows on TV, that I mean, I have walked into the most spirit-filled places, and I never sensed, never felt anything. Everybody thinks that when it when it comes to these shows, that the spirits always are there, always do something, right? But the spirits are not circus animals; they do not come out on cue. Okay, and I tell people that I say, you know, certain groups, and I said, if you're not experiencing anything, that doesn't mean that they're not, because we must realize that we live in one dimension and the spirit world lives in another dimension. They have all the time because time is nothing to them, nothing at all, nothing. And here in this dimension, we go by we go by the clock. Okay. And so I tell these groups, you must go back. And again, if you don't experience anything, if you don't experience anything, that it is a waiting game. And again, the spirits can wait till the, you know, wait forever, eternity, because again, there's no time. There's no sense of time on the other side. Is that, um, is that what true? Is that what you were talking about? Definitely. And you know, um, you know, I definitely don't want to get too far too too far away from your story because I'm very intrigued on it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's one of these deals that you do find that there's a certain circus atmosphere, and you know, it's there's been great things that have come out of uh, paranormal entertainment, and you have to call it entertainment because you know you're not going to go because I I know from experience of going to investigate places and check up on reported uh, activity and whatnot sometimes you may get you know a few little evps or you may get some temperature temperature fluctuations or you might get you know whatever maybe a, a, an odd photo of something something anomalous but overall some nights it's just you walking around in an old an old uh, building or in an old graveyard or whatnot um you're not going to get at least i've never been, been this uh lucky to peg every single investigation and get just gobs and gobs of stuff you know you have to kind of go and that's not saying that these people aren't honest but you know you can take a conversation that you and I have they can edit it any way they want to they can color it any way they want to spin it any way they want to and get any results that they want to and pipe in any right. sound and cut to any scene and you know so I can't put all the blame on any on certain investigators but like you said there's definitely this sort of uh, oh good lord I'm trying to I'm trying to 
think of the word. There's a levity sometimes, and I'm not saying don't have fun, but when it comes to a people in peril and it comes down to a person, especially if you're very religious, dealing with a person whose soul is in peril, that is definitely not the time for ego. It's definitely not the time for self. It's the time to be selfless and do your best to help that person. And like you've said, if you are not that person, step out, step away and let somebody help that can. Yes, that, yes, Steve. Yes, Steve, that is correct. I know that a lot of times that I have been called in as a consultant uh, with different groups, and all of them, and I will just, and I always, I don't want information on the home, nothing at all. I go in there cold, as they say. Um, I don't want any information. I want my gifts and talents. I want my angels to assist me um, in what I need to experience. Okay. Um, I have overheard some of these groups. They're they're talking about their own experiences and not allowing the family to really talk about what's going to them, to what's going on with them. And then I will go in and I will I will I will turn the conversation over um, to what is happening with you folks and such like that. Because again, um, we must keep our egos at the door. We must, if we want them, um, if we want to assist these these folks that have reached out to us. And um, and so I've said that to many, many groups, which really has made them, some of them very, very upset with me, and they do not call on me anymore because everyone wants to tell their story Okay, but again, as a therapist, someone comes to me for counseling. I don't go into my what's you know what's going on with me this day and what's been happening in my life. I am there for the person who needs assistance. And certain and the groups that go into people's homes, we must realize yes, you can tell if they ask. You can say, well, this is what we've done before and stuff like that. But again, that we are there for them. We are there for the folks who need assistance. And that if you're there because of your ego um, needs to be stroked, and then you need to leave. Okay. Um, going back to Kevin, if I may. Absolutely. Um, so we experienced the the demon um, inside of Kevin there. Um, we brought holy water. I always take holy water with me. I always have my crucifix. Always have my rosary. The priest did also. Um, and also what the priest did was that he took regular water as well as holy water, okay? He put water on Kevin, just plain water, and the demon laughed. He laughed, and he said, and I'll never forget this also, is that that is just plain effing water. That's all that you're spraying on me this moment. And then we put the regular water away, and then we went to the prayers. Um, and again, during this time also that I was calling Kevin's name, so Kevin would come back, okay? Um, demons just don't physically um, go into someone's body. Um, the demons also mess with, one, with one's um, emotion, also psychologically. They will mess with your dreams and all sorts of things. So every sphere of your life, the demon knows, knows your weak point, and the demon will hone in on those. Okay? And so we were talking to Kevin, and um, Kevin was a sl is a slight man. He isn't, he's not real tall. He's not uh, real built big, nothing like that. But when the demon came Fourth, um, Kevin's physical body changed. It changed right in front of our eyes. It's not like you grew long fingernails. It's not like a werewolf. Nothing like that at all. Okay, um, but you could tell physically that it changed. It's not that he's got real big muscles. Nothing like that. But you could tell that his body was changing because he became very, very rigid very rigid, rigid, um, um, and again, I always go with someone else to protect myself, 
and, and, and really and to protect everyone, okay? Um, the priest, we started to say some more prayers, um, and then Kevin relaxed, um, and Kevin was talking to us. He wanted to lay down. Um, and again, and I told Kevin, as well as everyone, that if someone needs to have the right of exorcism, they have to agree to it 100%. And we talked to Kevin about that. We also told Kevin that there is a battery of psychological testing that needs to be done. And at times it can be a very lengthy process. Um, though, because of the Catholic priest with me, who has the experience with exorcism and the demon, um, and what he experienced with Kevin, um, that process was... Uh, instead of, like I said, it was a very lengthy process. Um, it's only uh, that it was only two days of psychological testing, and that was it. Because the priest deemed that he was truly possessed, because the demon was telling something about the priest also. And Kevin would have never known this priest at all. Not at all, because Kevin is not Catholic. Kevin did not know that I was bringing a priest with me. I did not tell him. I told him that I was going to be coming with someone but I did not tell him that it was a priest. And so when the demon came through, um, um, Kevin, Ke Kevin and everyone who is possessed, they become the vehicle, the mouth of the demon, okay? And the demon was telling some things about this priest that only the priest would know. I And, and so the priest knew from then that Kevin was truly possessed. So we were with Kevin for about six hours, and again, we talked to Kevin about that if he wanted an exorcism, it was, you know, and he had to give us permission, but if there was any inkling in his heart, in his spirit, that wanted to keep this demon inside of him and did not need our assistance, then that was up to him. And Kevin agreed, and then the demon came back, and he began to cackle, began to laugh. Um, and right in front of us, right in front of the priest and myself, there was coffee cups, because we were having coffee, and a coffee cup moved. It didn't fly off the table. It moved maybe two or three inches. But that was just the demon showing us what he can do through Kevin. Okay. Um, there was no earthquake at the time. There was there was uh, no air that could move this cup because the cup moved on its own. And I remember the priest saying, "Is that all you have?" Talking to the demon, "Is that all you have? Is that all you can do?" Because the priest wanted to measure how how um, how strong this demon was, to you know, and to decide because there's different types of demons. Right. Okay. And the demon that he was dealing with was very, 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 very aggressive, very nasty, very powerful, very, very pow powerful. When, okay. So, so the priest was talking to the demon, um, and then, and then again, Kevin B. Kevin began to began to vomit. Um, we cleaned Kevin up. Um, and again, we asked Kevin, the priest asked Kevin if he wanted an exorcism, and he said, yes, he did. Um, and then we were there, all together, we were there uh, about eight hours, taking care of Kevin psychologically, emotionally, as well as physically. At one point, his Kevin's girlfriend came over, and she understood what was going on with Kevin, too. And she was very, very supportive of him having an exorcism. So the priest and I were there, like I said, eight hours. We told Kevin that we would get back to him. I asked Kevin, I gave Kevin the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel. I also brought a, a, a white candle for him to light the white candle 24-7. Always make sure that, because he did have a dog, to always make sure that the candle wasn't going to be just over and stuff like that. I did not want to fire. I did not need anyone to get hurt. Um, and so Kevin did those things. I said, Kevin, I said, two things could happen. By saying the prayer to St. Michael the Arch Archangel 
24-7, as well as lighting this, lighting this white candle, uh, because as we know in the book of St. John, that, that St. John calls Jesus the light in the darkness. It's not the darkness of the night, it is the darkness of the evil one. I said two things could happen. It could go off the chain even worse than what it is, or because it can become very, very oddly quiet. And I told Kevin that um, that I am, you know, here twenty four seven for him. Um, like I said, that we were there eight, between eight and nine hours. We said that we were going to get back to him. Um, so the conversation with the priest on the way back to Peoria, to Peoria Diocese, Catholic Diocese, um, and the my so the priest said that yes, that he deemed Kevin possessed. And that he was going to take his finding to the local bishop here in town, um, and then then he did, and the bishop signed off, and then he recommended the uh, monsignor, the priest, um, recommended that Kevin that we go get Kevin, and telling of his finding, and also that he needs to go to the Archdiocese of Chicago, where they have exorcists there. So two days later, Kevin and I are still talking on the phone, um, and I told Kevin of the paperwork that needs to be done uh, to protect him, as well as protecting ourselves, also protecting the church. Um, and again, it is, these papers state that, yes, that he, that he does want an exorcism, um, and that if need be, that he agrees to be restrained during the exorcism, um, and Kevin agreed to that. And so four days later, we went and went and got Kevin. In the meantime, the Monsignor had been talking to um, several exorcists within the Archdiocese of Chicago, and... And again, we needed some psychological testing. So Kevin and, and I and this priest, as well as Kevin's girlfriend, went to Chicago to the archdiocese there. And we were, I can't tell you where it was at because of confidentiality, but we went to a monastery in the Chicago area. And um, Kevin was there. We were there for seven days. Um, I must also tell you that some of the that one of the priests was a was a medical doctor. There was one who was a psychiatrist, one who was a psychologist, um, and they were all in and on it together. We were all there together. There were also some seminarians there. Also, uh, they were there to uh, to pray because there's certain prayers within the uh, the rites of the Roman rite of exorcism and so those prayers also needed to be answered we said the rosary together so all of us went to this monastery in in chicago um kevin went through two days of psychological testing he was deemed to be normal quote whatever normal is okay that he did not suffer from schizophrenia he was not paranoid nothing like that at all and, and in fact, that during the psychological testing with this priest who is very versed in exorcism, that the demon came out during this time and what the priest experienced, um, and then he came back and told us, um, was almost the same thing that we had experienced in Kevin's home. That this exorcism uh, took place in the morning when we began with prayers, um, and also, it was taped. With, with Kevin's permission, it was videotaped. Um, um, and that is to protect Kevin, and that is also to protect us and the church. That videotape, I have seen it once um, since that time, and it is, not, it is not open to the public to see it all. Uh, basically, they taped us, like I said, to protect Kevin, to protect the priests there, the seminarians, as well as the church. Also, that uh, with Kevin's permission, that then uh, um, that that this that this video then can assist in young priests who want to learn more about exorcism. So it's a learning tool. Okay. Um, this exorcism.
exorcism lasted three days. It wasn't like it was every hour. We took a break. Kevin physically needed to take a break. Um, again, when we all walked in, Kevin knew what was happening. He knew his girlfriend was there also. We were all instructed, of course, that when, when, the, when the exorcism began, that none of us, none of us respond to the demon at all. None whatsoever. The only person who was going to respond was two priests that actually did the exorcism. Okay? They could respond, but none of us could. Even when the demon called me out, when the demon called out the other priests and seminarians who were there and were telling us about ourselves, we have to we have to ignore it. Even the most vile things that he said about our family that we needed to just get that out of our mind. And that is most is difficult to do because when someone is attacking your family, of course you want to you want to come back at them. And what we need to do, what we did, um, is that we just ignored it, but it was quite difficult to ignore it, quite difficult. Because again, when the demon starts on someone else, then it takes away from what is going on with Kevin, okay? We find after about three hours of saying the prayers, holy water, and those types of things, Kevin became very, very violent. And again, there was a medical doctor who was a priest um, took his blood pressure and such like that. Uh, there were paramedics waiting downstairs if we needed them, and Kevin knew that. Um, there was a, I can say, Ly Lyola Medical Center, which is in Maywood, Illinois, which is a Catholic, it's a Catholic university as well as medical center. They were alerted to what we were doing just in case that we need uh, that we need their assistance, um, and and so again, Kevin knew that. Okay, um, and again, the exorcism lasted three days. Like I said, it wasn't like 24 hours a day. Um, did things move around? Yes. Did the windows shake? Yes. Did did we did we see things? Yes, we did. Um, did Kevin vomit? Yes, but it was nothing like the exorcist, like the exorcist that you saw on, on TV. It's nothing like that. Did Kevin wet himself? Of course he did. Did Kevin need to be restrained? Yes, he did because he became very, very violent. Very, very violent. Kevin remembers some of the exorcism, but by the grace of God, he doesn't remember probably 80% of it. Thank God for that. Kevin has not seen the video. He doesn't want to see it, and I respect that. Okay? Um, but again, I could go into, and I know we are very short on time, but again, there are so many things, so many things that happened within that room that uh, that would curl one hair. Um, it was horrifying. It was spiritual. It was painful. It was it was it was it was an eye opener to me um, to see how truly strong a demon can be. But by the grace of God, as we know, love always prevails over hate. And after three days, after three days, the exorcism, exorcism was over. Wow. The room the room changed completely. And again, I could go into the gory details because a lot of stuff happened within that room. Rosaries broke, um, candles would go out, and there was no, you know what I mean? Um, it wasn't caused by um, uh, the air conditioning or heat, nothing like that. Uh, like I said, the windows shook, uh, doors opened and closed and slammed, drawers opened and stuff like that. Um, and much, much more went on. Did Kevin's head turn around like Reagan's in The Exorcist? No, it did not. Did his throat get very, very thick? Yes. Did he talk in a guttural voice? Yes, he did. Did he laugh uncontroll uncontrollably? Yes, he did. Yes. Oh my God. All of his experiences, and there is much, much more, Steve, that maybe we can go into another time.
time, plus this other exorcism that I was involved in, and this other exorcism was with a woman. And when women are need an exorcism, it's a whole different ballgame. Yes, totally, totally different. Kevin, at this moment, is doing wonderfully. We talk to each other at least once a month. We have seen each other. Kevin knows where I'm at. If he needs me for anything, I am here. Um, Kevin has changed his life around completely. He goes to church, and it's not the fact that we told him that he had to. It was up to him, okay? But he knows, and anyone who has gone through an exorcism, they know that they are just one moment away from being for being possessed again. So they have work to do themselves. And Kevin is doing a wonderful, wonderful job. But again, there are more things I can tell you um, about what happened during the uh, psychological testing. Um, and there are more, more details that I can go into. But again, I know that we're short for time. Um, and maybe some other time that we can, we can go back and talk about Kevin as well as talk about this woman. I can tell you what her first name is. Her name is Vivian. Well, Vivian. Robert, I'll tell you what, uh, I am actually out of time at this point, but if you would stick around, I want to uh, do a quick segue and thank the people for tuning in. And I definitely want to have Robert back on to discuss more of this and get really deeply into this because it's, it's extremely interesting and I think an important subject. But what I want everyone to do is go out there, enjoy the rest of their day, and love each other, love themselves, and, uh, you know, don't be afraid to get a little scared. Until next time, everybody, take care, and God bless.